Ethiopia said Monday it is easing foreign exchange curbs as part of an economic reform package as the deeply indebted nation awaits a multi-billion dollar bailout from international lenders such as the International Monetary Fund. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed said the reform agenda will lay the foundation for economic growth and job creation. Ahmed Suleiman senior research fellow for the African program at Chatham House in London, says the reform package is a big shift as it is part of the liberalization of the Ethiopian economy, but he cautions that the economic trajectory can be derailed because of the ongoing conflict and unrest in Ethiopia. I think layman's terms is, is a good way to start. Essentially, this is quite a historic shift for Ethiopia, you know, because we're talking about the actual, seemingly liberalization of of Ethiopia's economy. Um, So both the the kind of foreign exchange system, shifting towards a market-based regime, um, you know, trying to ease the the kind of crippling foreign currency shortages that have uh, been in the country since, since Abiy's uh, government took over and even before that and trying to, to boost private sector-led growth. It, it is a huge, huge shift when you think about the state-led development policies of the former government under the EPRDF and actually, you know, the promise to liberalize early on under the, the Prosperity Party before that when, when, when Abby took over, but, but, but a re- realization of the difficulties in doing so, kind of curbing some of those liberalizations. So you, you kind of had one foot in uh, and one foot out. But I think that, that you know, the, the, the real crunch in terms of the fiscal problems that we've seen Ethiopia have over the last couple of years and, and the worsening of its fiscal uh, situation has meant that Ethiopia is now paying you know, it, it is agreeing to come into line with, with these international standards. Um, and, and, you know, this is largely in, being designed to meet the IMF requirements uh, to, to unlock a, a, a lot of uh, funding from both the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, the World Bank and other creditors. So it's really to try and assuage those creditors, uh, a number of them to whom Ethiopia holds uh, quite substantial amounts of debt. Mr. Suleiman, you're right. The IMF has been calling for numerous reforms of Ethiopia's tight state-controlled economy, including floating the currency in order to unlock the funding. But the Horn of Africa nation is battered in recent years by several armed conflicts, the COVID pandemic, climate shocks, and it has about, what, $28 billion of external debt. And it's also grappling with sky-high inflation and a shortage of foreign currency reserves. So with all this, can they really implement what they're actually trying to do? This is this is the difficult question. As we've seen immediately, in terms of the immediate impact, there's been a 30% devaluation of the bill uh, against the dollar, which, of course, will immediately contribute to, to inflationary uh, rises in, in some commodities. So there is a worry, I think, and there has been a worry in terms of the negotiations, which have rumbled on for some time over this issue of, of devaluation in particular, uh, and whether or not the inflation that we see will have a not only a, a kind of a further, because we've seen you know inflation going to double digit figures, uh, impact on the spending power and, and livelihoods of of, every, of Ethiopians every day, and whether or not that leads to further unrest in the country, which let's be very clear, Ethiopia cannot afford, uh, given as you pointed out, I mean one of the the most crippling parts of the economic trajectory uh, since 2019 and certainly late 2020 has been the evolution of, of unrest at war in Ethiopia, in the north, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the kind of conflict we have seen in both Oromia, the Amhara region, Benishango, other parts of the country which, which persists and that uncertain picture, which of course is a, a deterrent to, to, um, to economic growth, to stability, uh, to any sort of foreign direct uh, investment, certainly. Um, so I think there is, there, this, is a, this is a big gamble, therefore, in that regard, but, it, but it's a longer term one, and it would be one that would have to be based and predicated on 
uh, increased stability within the country. That's uh, Ahmed Soliman, Senior Research Fellow, Africa Program at Chatham House. The multinational security support mission in Haiti, led by Kenyan police, has been reporting partial successes in the past month since they arrived in the Caribbean country. But there has been little time to celebrate. On Monday, for instance, Haitian Prime Minister Gary Colnile came under fire as he left the General Hospital, also known as the Hospital of the State University of Haiti. Mr. Cornille, who came to power in April as a transitional prime minister, had walked into the hospital with a CNN crew led by Larry Madowo and was accompanied by Haitian National Police Director General Nomil Ramo and the General Commander of MSS Geoffrey Otungi to do an assessment, according to a dispatch. Towards the end of his interview, two shots were heard from the nearby neighborhood. After the PM had successfully completed the interview, he left the hospital with his security detail. But at one of the corners of the hospital, some security officers fired some shots to provide cover for the PMO's exit. A joint statement by the HNP and the MSS said on Monday. The PM left the scene and scuffed, but the police said they later pacified the area with no injuries or fatalities on their side. The hospital had been taken over by the HNP and MSS on July 8th after nearly four months of gun control and non-medical activity, which human rights groups said worsened the humanitarian crisis. But it is still not yet operational because of the damage on its facilities and those of other 30 medical facilities in the city. When the gangs upped their tempo of violence, hospitals were burned, prisons emptied, emptied, and police stations looted. At one point, the main airport in Porto or Prince was under gun control and so was the main port, which have been recaptured. The MSS now composed of 400 Kenyan police officers and it's expected to receive troops from Jamaica soon. As part of the team's efforts to provide security for critical infrastructure sites and transit locations, the MSS has made significant strides in patrolling and clearing road brocades that had been the mission said. Those who have observed gang in violence gang violence in Haiti, however, say the MSS should expect on off violence scenes throughout the missionary stay in Haiti. When they were touched down in June, for instance, gang leaders announced that they had withdrawn to the outskirts of the city. On Saturday last week, the MSS was confronted with a new battle in Gathir, just days after they had retaken the port from gangs. The town east of the capital, Porto or Prince lies on a main road connecting Haiti with the neighboring Dominican Republic. Gangs have reportedly used it to bring in surprise or smuggle drugs.